It's great to be back here, and it's also great to be here to talk to you about something that I have been deeply involved in in my whole life. And so it is here, as I show you, this is where I grew up. This is a picture I took a little more than 40 years ago, about two miles from from uh, our small farm. It was about 80 acres, diversified uh, kind of uh, sheep, pigs, cattle. Uh, and how I earned money to go to college was to cut rake and bale hay, $10 a ton. By the time I quit, we were charging 12 But this was how uh, I was able to make it happen, and this 40-acre field that uh, you see here now is all covered by very large multimillion-dollar houses. Uh, this picture, actually, yes, we raised livestock. Uh, I showed uh, purebred Suffolk sheep at the county and state fairs. This is one of my first published pictures, my younger brother Rick, right at lambing time. Um, this picture was probably taken about 35 years ago. And then my photographic career moved forward. Uh, this is uh, what I would call uh, in my later Grant Wood American Gothic phase of photography. <laughs> this is my parents. Both of them were fisheries biologists, so I got a pretty good uh, um, background in science uh, growing up at home. And, and we had this 80-acre farm. It was essentially a great lab for us to learn uh, about all of the things that it takes to uh, grow food. This is a real plot of corn. So that's me, and those of you who are on social media, my Twitter handle is at ddimick. And I'm here to talk to you today about this project. Uh, it started in May of 2014. Um, National Geographic magazine is uh, some may not know, but uh, for many years we were just a domestic U.S. magazine, but now we, cert we have about four million circulation in, in English language North America, and we have another four, four and a half million circulation globally in about 35 local language editions around the world. So the, the, the reach is great, but also the opportunity, uh, the challenge for us is also to find issues and stories that will appeal to a, a global audience, and that really is, I think, one of the things that we've been trying to do in the past decade. And in answering this question of why food now, I mean, when I was, you know, when I was in ag econ classes in, in, at the land grant universities and in farm business management, it was, uh, you know, we were, the ag guys were kind of the guys that were out on the west end of the campus and nobody paid attention to them. Uh, and uh, the mantra uh, the time I was in ag marketing was Earl Butt said, get big or get out. And then in the last uh, few years, all of a sudden food has come to center stage. And so I think what I'm going to try to do is help try to unpack, to use that word, to help you understand why some of that is. And if you look at what we've been doing for the past decade or so, and 10 years ago and in the fall of 04, we devoted 74 pages to the physical, ecological, and historical implications of, of climate change. And it, yes, it's been changing for a very long time, and we're tr we tried to begin explaining why it's different now. And we've looked at the disappearance of ice on the planet. We've looked at biofuels and what that, what, how much of a solution is that? We, a couple of years ago, we did an extensive report on uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing, uh, the emergence of this new technology and what it's done to energy exploration and the energy supply. We looked at oil, not natural gas, but oil in North Dakota. And as Andy mentioned, in 2010, we devoted a whole issue to uh, the world freshwater situation, something that we are continuing to do, and I'll talk to you about that at the very end. Uh, the uh, impact of extreme weather, and that does affect agriculture directly. And what we did with this particular story is we tried to help people. We took people along a, on a journey, a journey of discovery. How 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 can uh, how are scientists trying to figure out why this is happening, and what can they attribute it to? And in 2011, we had this year-long series on world population, and it actually set the stage for this, this, this um, inquiry on food. Uh, because by the time you get through uh, looking at 
energy, climate, water, population, one of the logical next questions is, and how are we going to feed everybody? But we've been covering agriculture for a very long time, and that's partly because, one, because of my own interest and in, in background in it, but also because I was uh, uh, fortunate enough to uh, uh, work with Chris Johns, who had, for 10 years, be, he was editor of the National Geographic. Uh, I met him in high school when he was district FFA president in Southern Oregon, and he he went on to become the state FFA president, and then eventually uh, uh, I loaned him one of my cameras, and he became a photographer, and eventually he became editor of National Geographic. And so we both knew that this idea of of soil and soil conservation was an important question, and really it's it's one of these uh, we take it for granted kinds of things, especially in this continent, because we are so blessed with such good soils. But if you look here, you see the woman in Niger on the left and the woman in China on the right. You begin to understand maybe there's there's something that those pictures are telling us about uh, why we read certain stories in the news today. This uh, gentleman with the deep soil in Kansas and um, uh, the gentleman on the right in Syria with his rocks in his soil, the success of a civilization is largely dependent over time by the soil that you inherit. And I think that if you see this, you, it, it, it helps us understand why we see such, you know, people are struggling in certain parts of the world because they just don't have the natural resources. As part of the food series of the population series in 2011, we also looked at the genetic uh, diversity of the food system, and it, it's actually the diversity of it is de is is declining. And and the, the, I think the reason that we did this was because in a world where the climate itself is changing and the conditions for growing crops that we rely on are shifting, the grain bowls that we count on uh, may not be in the future where they are now. Um, the idea was to help people realize that we're trying to save those seeds. And this is the Global Crop Diversity Trust. Uh, they call it Doomsday Vault in Svalbard. And this is Carol, Carrie Fowler of the Global Crop Diversity Trust. This is the ultimate seed bank of all seed banks. And countries all over the world are, are sending their seeds there to be stored. And the reason this is in Svalbard and the reason it is where it is is because it is cold so that the seeds won't uh, come to life, but it's also uh, at, built at an elevation. If all the ice on the planet were to melt, this seed bank would still stay dry. It would be above sea level. And that's important because about 90 percent of our calories come originally from these cereal grains. And they are threatened increasingly by things like this is the pervasive uh, wheat stem virus, UG99, in, in Ethiopia, that is the one way we have of stopping these kinds of things is finding resistant genes in other varieties. And so that's why seed banks are so important, because they provide us the toolkit that we need to adapt to a changing world. So this world is changing, and so we saw it in uh, in 07 and 08. What we saw was that there was a spike in world food prices. There was unrest. We did this st story in in June of 09 on the end of plenty, and it was written by um, our environment editor at the time, Joel Bourne, who was who is an agronomy graduate from North Carolina State, grew up on a farm. The guy knew what he was writing about. And the question at hand that we're all dealing with now, these, there's a confluence of things that are happening. We're dealing with a rising population. We know the numbers. But what's interesting, in 1900, we were 1.6, and just 100 years later, it had flipped to become 6.1. And in 2013, it was 7.1. And by 2050, of course, we hear, well, how are we going to feed 9 billion plus? And last year, the UN said by by century's end, it, will, it could well go to 11. That's a lot of mouths to feed. But part of it is this, as Andy said earlier, we're dealing with rising aspirations. We eat better. We're moving up the food chain. When you look at large landscapes, what you come to the realization is that these, these landscapes are devoted to raising uh, feed for livestock, for cattle, for hogs. This is soy in um, South America heading to China. 
rising aspirations. People, it's like Andy said, w when you have lived better, you want to eat better. And so here we are. And so the reason that we're hearing how much this need, we need to double food production by mid-century, it's not just because of numbers of more people, it's because of rising aspirations, more meat. But as we do that, we're also transforming landscapes. Uh, last fall at the World Food Prize in Des Moines, uh, Professor Ken Kassman of the University of uh, Nebraska, who studies such things, says you know, since the turn of the century, this century, we've seen a flattening in, in the yield increases of the major cereal crops. And the main way we have been increasing agricultural yields is through the expansion of the footprint of agriculture to the tune of about 10 million acres per year, transforming forests into agricultural landscapes. But there's another part to this thing that it's sort of like there's a, it's almost a trifecta of challenges that we're all up against. And one of these is rising temperatures. This is the other part, the unknown. And one of the most visible symbols here of this is if you look, this is NASA put up satellites that let us look at the whole Earth. And we're going to do a story later this year on this whole idea of what do we know about the Earth from looking at it. And in 79, they first started taking pictures of the Arctic ice cap. This thing has been there for thousands of years. And this is what it looked like at the end of summer in 79. By 2012, half of it had gone away had melted. So what that is really is just, it's a symbol, it's a sign, it's telling us that there are changes afoot on the planet. And one of the biggest uh, things now is, what does this change mean for weather in mid-latitudes? We're already seeing, so if you, gee whiz, for the last two years, we've already seen this sort of like strange behavior where the east is a deep freeze. I had pipes freezing in my house. I was going or I was becoming very adept at trying to, you know, leave faucets on this winter, but at the same time in the far west we were seeing record temperatures. And these kinds of of, of changes are really one of the big questions that we're facing, especially if we're trying to figure out how do we how do we find stable temperature and precipitation conditions to grow crops for more people. And so one thing that uh, I has, I've noticed and have kept track of is this idea about temperature in the summer. I'm sorry for the, for the projection, but the general gist here is that this was from a study that Ros Naylor at Stanford and David Battisti at the University of Washington did six years ago, and it was published in the journal Science. And what it was was this idea that uh, where will summers uh, in decades ahead be warmer than the warmest we've seen on record. And the, they used 2003 in Europe, which killed a lot of people, as a baseline. And so what you see here, if you can see the red and the orange, that makes a difference. And if you just look at the U.S., for example, you see that we're seeing warming in the West and in other parts. And that actually is beginning to hold true when you see actual observations in the ground especially in places like uh, California and the Sierra. But if you dial forward and you go forward, and what this is is you have to be willing to accept that actually science is, uh, you know, it's like I'm willing to, to, to accept that scientists are trying to figure out uh, honestly what where we're going given the current emissions patterns of our use of coal, oil, and gas. And they are, it, we're, it's a conundrum for us because they are the things that allow us to live Yet they are also uh, also implicated in the changes that we're having to confront as we try to provide stable environment to do things like grow food. And the thing here is that by the end of the century, we're looking at summers that are going to be warmer than we've ever seen most of the time. And, and the big issue here is about half the people on the planet live between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, and they depend upon rain-fed agriculture. And when you have temperature shifts like that, that's going to that's gonna have a big impact on on rainfall patterns and ability to do things like grow crops when you have things like heat waves. So what you do is then you have this kind of t trilogy of conditions that are all adding up. That's why, that's why I wanted to do this project on food now because they're all, these are all kind of background conditions that are affecting where we are going to be going and how we're going to be able to deal with these challenges. And as far as this magazine goes, it was a way to begin starting to have a conversation because it, as a child of the land, I was acutely aware of what these issues were and what it took to 
uh, meet the challenges and grow the food and watch the, you know, watch the lambs die in winter and watch the crops fail from the hail. But I'm not like most of America, and in the last 50 or 60 years, there's been a real dis, sort of disjuncture between agriculture and the people who uh, rely on agriculture to stay alive. And so the idea really was what we wanted to do was what we were really trying to reconnect eaters with farmers and eaters with landscapes and trying to help people go beyond that, oh, the food comes from the grocery store, but to really begin to start helping sort of explain. I mean, this is not prescriptive journalism I'm doing. I'm, it's descriptive and explanatory, and there's a lot of big, complex issues. And so what we did was we started in the May issue last year, and we asked the question, where will we find enough food for $9 billion? And the idea really was <clears throat> to try to be solutions-oriented or to try to frame out a discussion where people could begin to see that if we did certain things and we did more than one of them and we, we tried to, of course I understand that there's a problem with civil government in a lot of the world and infrastructure and all that, but part of the challenges here is you're trying to help inform people so they can, you're providing a background for a discussion. And so this one was framed in terms of it doesn't have to be industrial farms versus small organic ones there's another way. I mean, it's like everything is on the table. We need everything. And the framework came from a, from a, a, a long uh, study that had been done at the University of Minnesota. Jonathan Foley and some colleagues published this in the journal Nature in 2011, and, and we saw it as just a way to begin starting to have a conversation, and it was like, so what do you do? One is to freeze ag agriculture's footprint. I showed you the pictures of the burning forests. You know, if you want to do things like save tigers if, and, and uh, wild animals, if you think that's important, then you've got to quit cutting down forests. You've got to try to see if you can grow more on the farms we've got. And, and here in the United States, I'm, uh, I'm acutely aware that we're all about efficiency and making the most of what we have, but there are large areas on this planet where there are huge yield gaps between what could be and what is. And there's work that can be done. If you're just trying to take landscapes that have already been put into farming, how can we do a better job? How can we improve yields? How can we uh, preserve the landscapes so that they're not being mined? And that means using resources more efficiently. It's like, uh, you know, you hear about end-to-end -end, uh, precision agriculture here. It, those kinds of things, the questions that we kind of take for granted aren't even being addressed in large parts of the world. And so we can, you know, there, there are great opportunities when you think about this globally. The question of diets, I think it, it, we have to ask the question head on. It's really just this question about when, you, when you're eating higher on the food chain, you're devoting more resources and landscapes to produce the calories. And so the question really is not so much whether or not uh, you have protein, high quality protein, but how much do you really need? And how much also can we, how, how, how can we do that within uh, uh, the, the, the production envelopes and the, and the systems that we have so that we're not, we're not also causing more environmental damage. And then this other question about reducing waste, and that's a two-part question. Part of this has to do with, uh, you know, the question of, you, we hear the research about throwing food away in this country, and, but that's actually the, the, probably the bigger challenge that we're facing globally is how do we reduce harvest loss? globally in developing countries and countries, all those countries that where you could improve yields, cut yield gaps, we're also in a situation, how can we help do things like improve transportation, cold chains, markets, all the kinds of things that we here are just, it's all part of the world that we live in, but those kinds of things are so important to uh, producing and uh, being able to provide food. And so how we did this actually, what we did was we looked at the scale and the magnitude of this operation. We looked at, uh, this is in uh, Kansas, George Steinmetz, uh, a known uh, aerial photographer. What we did was we traveled around and we looked, we were trying to help people understand how big, how much, demand, how much resources are involved in this. This is a corn export terminal in Brazil. This is a chicken, of, uh, one of the largest chicken of, of egg laying operations in the Western Hemisphere in Brazil. This is where thighs are deboned in a, um, 
company in Brazil. This is celery in California that looks like logs. It's all being packed up in boxes and sent to China. So that's the kind of the scale thing, and we went around it. Part of it, we're just trying to help people say, yeah, look, this is a huge thing. It's the, one of the, it's the biggest enterprise of the world. We've transformed 40% of the world's acreage to produce food, but we also wanted to make it personal, and this is uh, here uh, a, a wheat farmer in the United States, but at the same time rice farmers in Bangladesh or a peanut farmer in Mali I think what we need to, what we're trying to do is help people also realize that agriculture comes in many forms. Farmers come in many shapes, faces, occupations uh, that uh, were n not all just the wheat farmers standing in a, a 50,000 acre operation in North Dakota. That it, big and small, uh, very diverse, these are potato farmers in the highlands of Peru. A tomato farmer in Wisconsin, George Naylor in Iowa, a soybean farmer. So what we are trying to do, remember that I think to keep in mind that the people that we're talking to, you are plugged into this. We're trying to connect to the people who are not. We're trying to actually try to connect to those people that uh, we saw in the Portlandia movie, okay? That's really where we're trying to help reconnect and help people understand what it takes to, to make happen. A turkey farmer in Kansas, this woman in the Ukraine harvesting cabbages. I love her expression. And so really it was like, come to meet. Who are farmers? Not a, It is not just land. It is not just production. It is people. And it is people who grow our food and m keep us from starvation. And that was the point that we were trying to make. So then, as I will go through quickly and run to the end, it's like so. And then the second piece was an uh, aquaculture. We've been farming the land for 10,000 years, but we've still been hunter-gatherers in the sea until almost till very recently. The question really is, what potential for farming the sea to produce protein? Uh, maritime environments, coastal inshore environments. This is uh, shrimp farming in um, Bangladesh. Um, an offshore uh, shellfish farm. And because it's important, I'm sorry the projector, but anyway what this does is it speaks about feed conversion ratios. And when you look at things like what you get for a pound of feed for a pound of, to get a, uh, take 6.8 from these numbers to get a pound of beef, 2.9 to get a pound of pork, 1.7 to get a pound of, of chicken, and depending upon conditions, of course, you have the potential of getting a pound of fish from 1.1. And I know that it all varies, but the point is we're just trying to help people understand that there are, there are different ways to skin the cat, as it were. The question of expanding footprints, the next breadbasket, why are big corporations grabbing up land on the planet's hungriest continent, Africa? And that's a big question because China's investing a lot in, in Africa. And so this medieval landscape in Ethiopia could have been taken 10,000 years ago, but this is what things are becoming. And, and I, a, a very interesting question in all of this is if you have a continent that has no has poor civil infrastructure, has, has none of the things we take advantage, uh, uh, take advantage of, like roads, electricity, uh, markets, and all that, uh, what good can come from this? And in a lot of cases, the, the fact that, that development is coming in is actually a benefit, but not all development is good. So we tried to explore that issue, that it's really not, we weren't really trying to do a story about white hats and black hats, so to speak. It was just trying to help uh, explore this this trend and why it's happening. And, and part of it has to do with countries that uh, have growing populations and they're trying to secure future food supplies. And they may be like, uh, China, they may not have sufficient water either, and so here you have the potential of developing resources uh, where you are not. Africa is already a great exporter of goats to the Middle East. And if we were to do a story, a series on food, we have to do a story on hunger right here in America, and it's an important thing when you think about 
that we are the richest nation in the world and we have such great agricultural productivity, why is it that 47 million people in this country are on food assistance? It's not simple. It's complex. And there's a variety of reasons for it. But at the same time, it's important for us to try to focus on that and see if it's possible where we could alleviate the situation. And it happens, these uh, last two pictures, they are from Iowa, right? The heart of agricultural productivity. But it, it's, it's not just that, it's also when, you, when you're living in urban areas and you have to spend most of your money on rent and you're just trying to get by, or you live in parts of the country where you need a car and you don't have a car, and so the only way you, so you're limited in where you can get your food, uh, all of these things add up. And so we just felt it was an important discussion to begin having with our readers about food, uh, abundance, inequality, and shortages. The question of diet, though, is really fascinating. And I think for us, it's like we're not just doing a, we're not just doing a series for ag majors here. We're actually trying to speak to a public that is interested in food. That's why we use the food lens, because that brings us in, that's a different lens than saying we're doing an ag series, right? And, and because we know that food touches us every, everyone every day. And this idea of the evolution of diet, some experts urge modern humans to eat from a Stone Age menu. So what's on it may surprise you. And we, we looked at that because it's like, well, it's like uh, Andy was showing the covers of the books of things. It's like, okay, let's get behind the obvious. and let's. So what is a Stone Age diet? Okay, well, you want to go get fish in the Arctic? Or how about goats and you can have a special kind of cheese? Or maybe, you know, the original barbecue. This is, right, this is, I mean, let's put, let's put a face to these kinds of things so people understand really what it's about so it gets behind the glib statements. And so, in fact, though, the diversity of diets, the diets that we have today are all evolved from these kinds of things. And one question really is, is the diet that we have the healthiest for us? That's a good question to ask. Another, uh, a, the next two stories, actually, the next green revolution, modern super crops will be a big help, but agriculture can't be fixed by biotech alone. I think what we were trying to do here was that we were trying to help explain the role of genetics, the role of biotechnology, that, that um, biotechnology does not equal GMOs, that there are other uh, biotechnology tools that are very useful, like marker gene breeding that allows us to do things like speed up dating, essentially speed up breeding. It's essentially, imagine it's speed dating for seeds where you're breeding by genotype instead of phenotype. And you can get results much faster uh, than you, you could. Those are really important tools. And so that's what we were trying to do with this story, to try to get into the nuance of the issue of what this means and to try to help people realize that, you know, you hear GMOs, but it's much more complex than that. And so looking at the history of the breeding of wheat or uh, flood tolerant rice or here at the International Rice Research Institute um, trying to figure out if they can um, put the photosynthesis gene from corn into rice to improve productivity. Uh, this story, Carnivore's Dilemma, Carnivore's Dilemma, the tagline on this was it's tasty and nutritious or it's unhealthy, unsustainable and cruel, pick a side in the beef debate. And our writer, Rob Kunzig, staff writer, actually, he, he went through this journey and it's complex and the answers are not easy. And uh, not all animal agriculture is the same. And he tried to explore that very even-handedly. And we used, uh, we, uh, the photographer for this was Brian Fink, a Texas native who looked at the culture of beef in Texas as a way to tell a story about how something is so central to our being. Uh, I recommend this story to you because I think it's an attempt to try to go beyond the uh, obvious tropes 
and get into the nuance. It's, these are hard questions, and it would be remiss of us to not confront something like this in our series. Um, and we ended the series itself. Uh, agriculture, most of that word is the word culture. And so what we're trying to do really is to go beyond just the food part, but to help people understand that, that uh, food is central to our culture. We begin the day with breakfast here. Our families gather for dinner on Sunday evening. That the culture part of it is just as important uh, as the food part of it, and that it is food is one of the key binding rituals of civilization. And by talking about the joy of food, actually what you do is we're able to connect with many people who are then maybe we can then tell them other things about food and agriculture because we have found a door into their life that they, that they want to think about when they're thinking about food. And that was the closing piece that we did in December. But this, the work continues. Uh, any good meal needs its condiments, and as part of this whole project, we, we teamed with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and to work with them and their, their data to try to help also um, illuminate some of the trends in the world. And it wasn't just them that we worked with, but this piece was on uh, the history and evolution of forks, the evolution of the varieties of apples. Um, this is, uh, you hear about meals ready to eat. Well, what is in them? This was just trying to be novel about this. This piece was on food miles. All these things were purchased in a store in uh, New York. Where did they come from? I'm sorry, if you imagine the lines there, you'll see they're all lines radiating out across the world. Uh, this one was on uh, berries tr uh, moving from California to New York, how far they go, uh, the whole mechanism and what it takes to make it happen. It's like, oh, well, the berries are in the store. Well, let's talk about how, how it was made possible. Uh, I talked earlier about biofuels. It's looking at uh, biofuels, a statistical look. Uh, water exports, embedded water in food. That's, this is actually one of the big global questions that uh, is, we're beginning to now pay attention to because the global grain trade often is we're, we're, we're actually moving water around as much as we're moving grain around because people are, countries are buying grain because Saudi Arabia, after the oil, Arab oil embargo in the 70s, uh, decided that they can't eat oil, so they started growing their own wheat, and so they started mining aquifers that have now depleted. They're back now on the world grain trade. This on the rising demand for meat globally, just statistical analysis. It's, it's a useful, informative picture. And last, this thing, actually chickens. Uh, what we did here was we just looked at chickens and where do all the pieces of a broiler go? And the people in the U.S. love those white breast, breast meats, but a lot of the world doesn't. So this actually was, we took a chicken apart literally and showed you where it all went. So we are online also at natgeofood.com. That's our hashtag if you're into social media. And so what we have is we have an ongoing conversation where uh, it's not just the magazine stories, it's also a variety of news articles, uh, columnists. Uh, I've written several pieces on drought and agricultural research and aquifers, uh, these kinds of questions. And we have... Um, uh, the plate, which is a, a place where people can write about food and agriculture. Um, Marin McKenna writes about food science issues. Uh, so we have that, and that's ongoing. And, and I can say that when we began this journey, we, had a, we, we found a lot of skepticism in the marketplace. And once people started seeing what we were doing, we had uh, large organizations coming to us asking if they could help support this. We did get support out of the Rockefeller Foundation for this project. But it's a multi-year project now, and we, we are continuing. We actually had originally conceived it as a single-year project, but as the ag kid in the house, I kept saying, but friends, just because the project ends doesn't mean the challenge does. 
And this, for me, is actually, as they said at, uh, in Des Moines last fall at the World Food Prize at the, uh, the Borlaug Dialogues, uh, we are facing, this is perhaps the greatest challenge facing humanity in decades ahead. How are we going to do this? So we try to keep the conversation going in a variety of ways. This one, this will be out, I think, in July or even this month on uh, the rise of the culture of food trucks. It's been a fascinating. Uh, it's uh, changed uh, uh, the restaurant business in this country. Uh, building better bees, this is out next month. It's the question of how do you, um, how do you build, how do you um, protect pollinators? And at the very end, we have other things we're going to be doing on the science of taste, on we're going to look at food waste, uh, post, uh, harvest losses, we're going to look at food labor, we're going to look at the origins of agriculture, and I think one of the last, the vanishing aquifers, I think that's one of the great untold stories that's not getting enough attention when you look around. You look at the High Plains Aquifer, the North China Plain, you look at uh, the Central Valley, you look at the Colorado Plateau, we're mining, we're sort of depleting our bank account to pay for current expenses. And if you're interested, all this stuff is available. Uh, if you go to iTunes, Nat Geo, Future of Food, it's all available free as an iPad edition if you're interested in seeing all that.